Good morning all. We'll start with the new course, course code CE305 Geotechnical Engineering 2 for 5th semester. Now, like I just mentioned in the previous meeting we had in the Google Meet, the subject cannot be strictly called as a continuation, but rather Geotechnical Engineering 1 can be called as a prerequisite for Geotechnical Engineering 2 for the simple reason that these two subjects club together was called as soil mechanics and foundation engineering which means for us to identify and understand the behavior of foundation engineering we need to know what soil mechanics is so in short by studying geotechnical engineering one you have studied soil mechanics and now you are about to deal with the foundation engineering which is called geotechnical engineering two in your syllabus Again, like I mentioned in the introductory part in the Google Meet that we had earlier, the first module is about stresses in soil due to loaded areas. Now, if it's a point load, you depend on equations proposed by Businesk and Westergaard. Now, in our syllabus, the analysis is limited to Businesk equation. The second part is about the vertical stress beneath loaded areas which can be strip which can be circular or can be rectangular or even any shapes other than the ones that we have mentioned now then you come to another term called as an isobar and a pressure bulb which i believe is quite an interesting term in the first module now this picture that you see to the right bottom corner i've tried to make you understand how the soil would look like in different strata. As you cut the soil, you can see that the strata is not uniform, the soil is not homogeneous, the soil is not isotropic. Though we assume the soil to be isotropic, it really is not isotropic and homogeneous. So the picture that you can see to the to the bottom right corner it shows two different layers. Of course it's two different colors that you see, but still you can consider it as two different layers. So Soil is quite complex, right? The material is too complex because it involves drainage, it involves anisotropy, non-homogeneity, etc. But what we fundamentally do is we assume the soil to be elastic, isotropic, homogeneous, etc. for us to analysis, for us to carry out the analysis, right? Now the stresses in soil may be due to Number one, the self weight, which we have defined in the previous semester as gamma into H, right? When you have soil of unit weight gamma, and if you want to find the stress it offers at a level H below the ground level, the stress is gamma into H for a for a column of one by one in plant. Now that's a self weight. Now the second one can be the applied loads. Soil can have applied loads acting on it a building is an example now for us to analyze we need to find the poisson's ratio mu and the young's modulus e using the triaxial test now there are different tests but we usually rely on the triaxial test for determination of e the young's modulus and mu of soil now, this one is just a schematic representation of a triaxial test as we have already discussed in the previous semester, triaxial test is carried out on a cylindrical sample, which usually is of a 38 millimeter diameter and 76 millimeter height. Now, the, the, the range of Young's modulus E of soil could be around 2000 to 20,000 kilopascals. It's just an example. The mu of soil, the Poisson's ratio, could range from 0 0.2 to 0 0.5. Again, just an example. It's not strictly within that range, I should admit. Now, there are different ways to estimate the young smallness of soil. Now, unlike in steel, the soil is not exhibiting a linear, elastic, perfectly plastic stress strain plot, which means it doesn't go straight and then it doesn't go perfectly plastic linearly elastic perfectly plastic you can't expect that for soil even you can't expect that for steel as well but still for the sake of analysis some people used to 
you, you just assume that the steel behaves that way, but it really isn't. Now, the stress strain plot of soil being a complex one of, of let's say, of uh, this nature, as you can see in the graph, there are different ways in which E can be assumed from the graph. Hooke's law may not be directly applicable to get Young's molars of soil. And for, for, for obtaining or estimating Young's molars of soil, the deviated stress is plot in y-axis, which we call the axial stress, and the axial strain is plot in the x-axis. So the plot would look something like this. Deviated stress on the y and the axial strain on the x. So these are results that you get from the triaxial test. Now, based on that, based on the plot that you get, which is not linear elastic and perfectly plastic, instead it's some other curve tree. Now, you can have an initial tangent modulus or initial secant modulus to estimate the Young's modulus E. I can show a picture here. Now, the first line that we draw here is an initial secant modulus which means you start at origin zero you take any point along the curve which is a red color join these two points using a straight line the slope of which gives you a secant modulus which we call as an initial secant modulus because it starts at the origin likewise there's a tangent modulus marked here which means you take any point on the curve, the curve being the red line, you take any point there and you draw a tangent at that point. The slope of which gives you the tangent modulus. These are, these are various methods that we use graphically to estimate the young smallest of soil. Now the initial tangent is considered for usually an extent of 0.5 to 0.33 of the peak deviated stress and the initial secant modulus is of the range of 0.33 of the peak deviated stress. Now the stresses in soil, like we said just a few minutes back, may be due to the self-weight which we call the geostatic stress or it can be due to applied loads. Geostatic stress is nothing but the self-weight which is significant for geotechnical problems as it may carry the major portion in some cases. For instance, slope stability problem that we discussed in the last module of the previous semester. There, major force was the geostatic force, which means a component of the weight of the soil was inducing the failure, right? So geostatic stress was quite crucial there. It may carry a major portion of the design governing. Now, you can see a column of soil here, which is a one by one square in plan. And the soil has a unit weight gamma, a bulk unit weight gamma. And I've taken a column of depth H here. Now the vertical stress at a level below a point is arrived by taking the total weight divided by the area. So in this case, the total weight is unit made multiplied by the volume. The volume is 1 by 1 by h or simply h. So the total weight is gamma into 1 into 1 into h or gamma h. So divided by the area gives you the stress, right? So that stress is nothing but gamma h divided by the area is 1 by 1. So it's nothing but 1. So everything boils down to stress equal to gamma h which I've marked here as sigma v is equal to gamma h which means the stress in the vertical direction on a plane is gamma into h, where h is the depth below the ground level. Now, once you get sigma v, you can find sigma h, which is the horizontal stress, by multiplying a term called coefficient of lateral earth pressure. In short, sigma h is equal to k times sigma v, or k times gamma into h. Now this, we'll keep it as such for the time being because we'll have to discuss this in detail in the next module. Now when we talk about the stresses due to the applied loads, this is a picture that we have, I mean I have shown in the introductory slide. If you remember, we were discussing that the load from the column 
is taken by a footing, an individual footing in this case, and the load is transferred to an area beneath the ground. So, if you assume an area like this, the intensity of stress goes on decreasing as you go down and it goes on decreasing as you go radially outward. So that's that's a usual trend that we see. Now the stresses can be due to a point load, it can be due to a line load, it can be due to a circular area load or it can be due to a load on a rectangular area or even on an irregular geometry which is a usual thing that we see. Now we'll try to discuss each one in the next video.